Takeoffs often don't get much attention. Unless it is V1 cuts in the simulator, they are often an afterthought of training. However, when exploring the backcountry, many runways are shorter, rougher, and in tighter spots than a standard paved runway. Typically, airplanes are usually heavier with gear from your most recent adventure, and the same scenery that makes the destination so attractive also provides plenty of challenges when trying to take off and depart. Furthermore, all of these considerations have to be thought out before you land since the majority of small airplanes are limited by their takeoff capabilities and not their landing performance. Unless you own a carbon cub or some other crazy experimental, you can easily land but not get back out. For all of these reasons, a short takeoff roll and efficient initial climb are critical. Let's look at this high altitude one-way strip. While the runway itself is long by backcountry standards, there are quite a few other variables to think about. Which direction to take off is made for you by the slope and surrounding terrain. There is almost always a west wind, making it a tailwind takeoff with downdrafts at the departure end of the runway. On one hand, you can follow downstream and indeed might have to if takeoff performance is limited, but there is a better counterintuitive option of turning upstream and uphill and having a landout option available in the event of any trouble. This is a fairly typical backcountry scenario and it is imperative that you don't leave precious room behind you with a long takeoff roll. We won't be talking too much about the departures as we will touch on that in a later video, but we will be talking about the takeoff roll and how to break it down so the shortest roll can be achieved regardless of weight or plane type. We believe that the shortest roll provides the safest margin and allows for more options for tight places or difficult environmental conditions. In the first part of this series, we talked about how a flat wing can help you consistently hit a predetermined spot and how good fundamentals can be used in a variety of conditions very effectively. Similarly, we are going to show how rhythm, muscle memory, and experience are more important than book numbers and rotation speeds when doing short backcountry style takeoffs. Most takeoff training in general aviation consists of lining up on centerline, slowly advancing the throttle, making sure the airspeed is alive, and rotating at a predetermined speed. This is usually taught regardless of weight, wind conditions, aircraft configuration, or runway environment. Other than a vague and often simulated nod to short and soft field procedures, primarily for checkride purposes, little consideration is given to short and soft field takeoffs. We teach rolling tail-up takeoffs with positive rotation and very importantly, remain in ground effect until true flying speed is reached. We teach rolling tail up takeoffs for several reasons. One, it gets your prop, tail, and tail wheel out of harm's way so you aren't constantly having to patch your tail from debris or replace your fragile tail wheel from rough surfaces. It also allows for smoother turning takeoffs so your tail isn't hopscotching along and most importantly, it allows you to see where you are going, particularly if there is a dog leg or slope to the runway. Finally, it allows for a more positive rotation due to increase in angle of attack. With some first class cheesy animation, we can define each segment of the takeoff roll. One, the initial roll. Advance the throttle quickly. Keep your eyes outside and track your desired path. Two, your tail comes up. Your hands and feet are busy and your eyes are outside, not on the airspeed. Three, flaps and rotate. Here you pop the flaps and try to milk some energy efficiency while remaining in ground effect. Now let's watch a takeoff in real time in a carbon cub at 6,000 feet density altitude. It is just under five seconds. While that is abnormally fast, let's look at a more realistic scenario. Here is a modestly loaded Mall M7 on the same day but with a small tailwind. 
it is just over seven seconds. At these kinds of speeds, developing a rhythm for each segment of the approach is very important. I teach verbally counting potatoes to develop that rhythm. I use potatoes, but some people prefer tiddlywinks or axle shafts. We are going to use the venerable super cub to dissect this method. Power comes forward, one potato, two potato. Tail comes up, one potato, two potato, three potato. Flaps and positively rotate. Notice we stay in ground effect to gain energy efficiency before beginning our climb out. Now, let's follow along in a carbon cub. Power comes forward, tail up, one potato, two potato, flaps and rotate. Notice the airspeed indicator. We are airborne and it is barely coming alive. Notice again, we remain in ground effect until flying speed is reached. This count is going to be different in each type of plane and configuration. I have found that verbally counting helps mitigate these differences into common segments. What might work for a light 185 at sea level is going to be different than a heavily loaded mall in the mountains. Having a count also allows you to plan your takeoff. If you have a decent tailwind on a warm day, you can consciously plan beforehand to have, say, a 9 potato day instead of a 6 potato day. Rather than picking some imaginary and arbitrary abort point, you can have a tangible and accountable abort point. Simply by knowing your counts, you can diagnose the health of your takeoff, whether it's a sticky break or a stronger than expected tailwind. If your tail doesn't come up when you think it should, that is a good time to abort rather than airborne and staring at some trees. The important takeaway is these takeoffs happen pretty fast. The airspeed indicator hasn't even come alive by the time you are rotating, and there are plenty of other variables to pay attention to as you begin your roll. Having a routine that is as much muscle memory as it is rhythm allows you to get airborne and in-ground effect the quickest way possible. It also allows you to diagnose the takeoff and feel if it is going as planned. This leaves you with more options, which is always a good thing when operating in the backcountry. Join us for our next video, the flare, touchdown, and rollout.